Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our series of Zoom sessions with our members of the Downey Symphony Orchestra. Today, we will be talking to our principal tuba player, Mr. Tom Carlson. And I still can't get over saying this, but Tom Carlson has been the principal tubist of this orchestra for nearly 44 years. Yes, you heard that correctly. I had to make him tell me that twice yesterday. Uh, I believe his first concert was, I think he said January 8th, 1977. Correct. So we're going to talk, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but I'd like to welcome today, please, our wonderful guest, Mr. Tom Carlson. Hello. This is the Zoom, this is the Zoom clap, Tom, that everybody gets. Uh, Tom, why don't you just start by, you know, giving, a, giving us a little bit about your background, where you're from, um, when, where you went to school, all that good stuff. And I'd also be curious to know um, not only when you started playing the tuba, but why? Because this instrument is is not an instrument that you know every child dreams of, you know, uh, to 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 uh, play growing up. So if you could just talk a little bit about all those things, we we would love it. Well, you sound like my parents. Why? <laughs> why would you pick up this instrument? <laughs> well, I was born in La Mirada, which is just a city or two away from Downey. So I have long roots in that area. Mm. Um, lived there for about five years. And then we moved up to a town called La Habra Heights, which is also not too far from Downey. It's up uh, near Whittier, Fullerton, that area. And uh, when I was in the third grade, I went to, uh, they had a, an assembly at school with a orchestra and I had never heard anything like this before. It was, I was gobsmacked. They played the 1812 overture and the, when the uh, tubas played and the bass drum and everything else, I just had never experienced that before. And I became a total addict to the bass end of the orchestra. So, you know, that that was really something. I mean, when I started buying stereo equipment a little bit later, the first thing I got was a subwoofer, you know, to recreate <laughs> that. <laughs> so uh, let's see, when I got to junior high school, um, I had played a little bit of piano as a kid. And uh, in junior high school, they had two tubas in the uh, band room and only one person to play them. So they asked if I'd want to do it. It was a friend of mine that played the other tuba. So I started in seventh grade and um, I guess part of it was I figured it would be an instrument my parents wouldn't nag me to practice. So, <laughs> so uh, the great Tommy Johnson used to say that the tuba was the only instrument that they wouldn't let him take home. So that's why he took that one up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so we, uh, let's see. So seventh grade, eighth grade, and then I got to high school, got in the band. And then started doing a lot of marching band, um, concert band, uh, not much orchestra. We didn't have much of an orchestra at that school, but a lot of band stuff. And then from that got into a uh, youth band, the Cavaliers Youth Band, which is, um, I don't know if that's still going or not, but it was wonderful. It, it was a chance to socialize and make music and everything else. Uh, and then from there, uh, like Danielle, I got into drum and bugle corps mm. and mm. played contrabass bugle, which is this monstrosity that, I mean, it's a, it's a very strange thing. It's got one piston, one rotor, and a slip slide. So it's a combination of a bunch of different instruments. And oh, it plays, see that. yeah, it's the, the big bass bugle. But again, like Danielle, um, from that, I started really getting interested in classical music because our show that year, we did Firebird Suite, we did Mambo from West Side Story. Uh, you know, it, there were several classical pieces. Um, folk Song Suite, we did one season. So uh, from that, I thought, well, I wonder what the original of these sound like. And mm -hmm. then, you know, found out the Firebird and then, well, I wonder what this guy's other stuff sounds like, the Stravinsky guy, listen to the Rite of Spring blown away by that. And then, you know, of course, Fantasia. So it, it was the kind of thing that just sort of grew over time. Mm -hmm. um, 
in school, I was always more of a kind of a science guy, more of biology and all that kind of stuff. So I was, I was all set to go to college at Northwestern where I went to school. They had a, a six year medical program where you go to two years of college and then straight into medical school. So I was all set to do that. Parents were really happy with that. And I'm the, sure. <laughs> the summer before I went back to school, I sent in an audition tape uh, to the school of music with a tuba audition and got accepted. So, um, Whoa. yeah. So and that's that, Northwestern. I mean, that's, yes. that's a really good music school. Right. So the, then it became a question of, well, do I, now do I become a doctor or do I become a musician or some other thing with music and music seemed like a lot more fun. So that's the one I picked. <laughs> and, um, and I studied at Northwestern with a, a really great uh, tuba pedagogue, Arnold Jacobs, who sure. uh, was world famous for every instrument. I mean, he taught, he was a, the world's expert on breathing for musicians. Mm. And um, he himself, I, I never got the story straight, but I think he only had one lung, or at least he had uh, only a part of his second lung. So he was always operating with uh, limited lung capacity and yet could just outperform anybody in the world and volume and, and the breadth and the scope of his sound. So, um, so he was a great, uh, a great, great teacher. And I studied with him for two years. And then uh, after my sophomore year, my older sister, finally, they were getting a doctor, she was going into medical school. And my <laughs> younger sister was working on you know, heading towards a PhD in engineering. So the arts funding got cut and I, <laughs> I came back home and this is how I started playing uh, with the community orchestra. So um, I came back home for a couple of years and worked as a photographer, but also um, started playing with the community orchestras. And at that time, there were probably about a dozen orchestras around town. Mm -hmm. um, it was much more supported. Um, not every community nowadays has the kind of support we have in Downey. Right. But at that time they did. So I played, I would say, played regularly with four of the orchestras, La Mirada, Rio Hondo, Downey, and uh, Highland Park. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a few others too. Um, so uh, the tuba player for the Downey Symphony, uh, the great, tuba player Gene Picorni had just left in 1975. He was actually a USC student. And while he was at USC, he was also playing with Downey. And once he graduated, he got the job. Uh, I think Zubin Mehta may have heard him um, mm -hmm. with the Israeli Philharmonic and went and left. So they had been casting about in Downey for another tuba player. And I just, it, the timing just worked out. I came there at the, um, at the end of 1976, I think I auditioned uh, and got the job. So that was the beginning of Downey. And so, I mean, essentially what you're saying is you replaced Gene Picorni. No one can now, replace Gene Picorni. I mean, <laughs> and this, I mean he's, world, he's world famous. Yeah. And he, how many years did he play with the Chicago Symphony? Well, I believe he still is, and it's been since. Um, now, this is the interesting thing: is that Gene then moved to Chicago Symphony. He replaced my tuba teacher in the Chicago Symphony, who was Arnold right. Jacobs, who right, was the right, principal right. tuba for the um, Chicago Symphony. So there was that connection as well. So. Right, right, right. Um, amazing, and just to think that you know Gene Bacorny is from Downey. I've just yeah. always loved that. That yeah. And he's the nicest man. I mean, that's something I've found through the years. Uh, every, every section has their personalities, you know, and tuba players always get kind of, you know, teased about being the big, you know, sort of schlubs. But I have found some of the most intelligent people in the orchestra were the tuba players. I mean, interestingly enough, there's um, Jim Self, brilliant tuba player. He, he sure. teaches at USC. Sure. Um, you know, Doug Turnquist is a really, really smart guy. Arnold yeah. Jacobs was practically a doctor, you know, he, so, and Gene is super smart. Norm Pearson, who plays the LA Phil. Sure. They're all really, you know, educated, really great, thoughtful people. So that's just that's such a great story. Um, 
I'm sure our audience members know this, but just in case they don't, the, the Downey Symphony is not a place for musicians to be a full-time musician, right? So they, right. the Downey Symphony musicians play in many, many orchestras all over town. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly this is not what your full-time job is. I was thinking maybe you could explain to our audience, what is your full-time job? Well, my full-time job right now is retirement, <laughs> but previously <laughs> my full-time job was as a film music editor. So I worked in the, in the film industry um, editing music. I did that for about 37 years. Um, uh, after I, uh, those two years in LA, I went back to Chicago, got my degree, and then um, I was at the very end of that, and I just had no idea what I was going to do. Uh, I didn't, you know, I, the teaching seemed interesting there, mm -hmm. you know, there are several different ways that you could go with music, but none of them just grabbed me. Um, mm -hmm. I was also a huge cinephile. I love movies. In fact, I would go sneaking off and I should have been studying, uh, <laughs> take the L down into the, uh, you know, to the Chicago art museum for a film program, Goethe's Faust or whatever, you know, whatever was mm -hmm. the program that you couldn't see any place else. Mm -hmm. So I was ready to graduate. Um, I got contacted by the Northwestern Alumni Association of Southern California, and they were asking me, well, you know, do you want to come back to Southern California? And if you do, can we help you get a job? It's like, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so um, I told them what I, my interests were, and they said, well, you know, we have, there's one of our alumni that's a film uh, composer, actually writes music for movies. Why don't mm -hmm. you talk to him? So I contacted him and he said, well, it's very, very, very difficult to become a film composer. Um, there's this other job that seems like it might fit you and it's called film music editing. And he had just worked on a project with a woman uh, named Elsa Blankstead. Um, and she was a, a music editor and he was very impressed with what she did. So he introduced us and then I talked to her, we really hit it off. And I bothered her every night around dinner time for about six months until she finally gave up and hired me. So, <laughs> so that's what I did. I worked with her for a number of years. Uh, the first movie I worked on was on Golden Pond. I don't know if you remember. Oh, wow. That. Yeah, with Henry oh, Fonda. One of, my, of course, one of my favorites. Yeah. And Jane Fonda. And, um, right after that, we did Tootsie. Uh, oh my god Dustin Hoffman so I was thinking man this is this film business this is awesome it's like regular hours and nice people and all <laughs> little did I realize uh you know because she was at the very very top of her her game and um was sure. working on all the premiere projects which is not always the case in the film business you know we never right. had any of the ones that I ran into later where you'd have to work 48 hours in a row you know <laughs> right so, but anyway, wow. so that's how I got started. And, and then I went over to 20th Century Fox and worked with a brilliant music editor, uh, one of the greats uh, named Ken Wanberg. There's actually a, a chair at USC, the Ken Wanberg Chair in Music Editing that mm. was sponsored by George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. Oh, so wow. Kenny, who is a, a very dear friend, um, was John Williams music editor. So I got to work a lot with the great John Williams as nice. I was being trained. In those days you worked for a two and a half years as an, it was a real guild. So you do two and a half years as an apprentice and then two and a half years as an assistant and then you became a full-fledged editor. So that second two and a half years uh, as an assistant, I was Ken's assistant. So got to work a lot with John. And um, that, that was unbelievable. I mean, he is. Now, I was going to say, now, is that, is that how you know Sean Murphy? It is. Okay, the, because yeah. when I was working with Sean down in Pacific Symphony, the first thing when we met each other, the first, I, you know, we were just talking back and forth, what do you do? And, and I, one of the things that I do is I conduct the Downey Symphony. You conduct the Downey Symphony. You know my buddy, Tom Carlson. I yeah. Said, yeah, of course I know Tom <laughs> Carlson. Yeah. Well, Sean. I mean, I've been very, very lucky to have worked with and been friends with the people that you can say, this is the best person in, in the world at what they yeah, do. And Sean absolutely. is, Sean is one. And no offense to, there are other really great 
uh, mixers course. as well. But uh, of Sean is just non pareil So I just want to show the. I mean, look. This is this is just a portion of some of the movies that you've worked on. Correct. Correct. Yeah. There's actually probably closer to 150. But oh, the yeah. early ones, I, they didn't always credit the assistants and apprentices. Sure, so. of course not, of course not. I mean, we'd be here for a while if I had to show all your movies. <laughs> Look at this, wow. Um, all right, good. So I see that you've got some uh, beautiful shiny instruments behind you. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could talk a little bit about, there are you know several different tubas that you play. Um, maybe you could just at least talk about that and. Tell us why you would play one tuba versus the other. Okay, well, um, let me, I'll just turn around here and pick one of them up. This reminds me of when we um, demonstrate for the kids and we show all the different instruments and we get to the tuba and Tom, you always hold this tuba up and then all the kids go, whoa. <laughs> They think, wow, you're so strong. Right, and then I play show tunes <laughs> for my demo. Um, so this is a C tube. I don't know if you can see that, but it's yep. in C. And the reason it's called C is because it's um, 16 feet of tubing all wrapped around. So if you were to unroll the whole thing, it would be 16 feet long. And wow. that's what's called the fundamental pitch. Mm -hmm. So that is the lowest note on that instrument. Um, and then I'll, I'll demonstrate this a little bit later, okay. but that 16 foot C is the resonant frequency of the, the instrument. That's kind of like your bass tone. Right. And then um, everything after that is uh, the, what they call the overtone series. Um, so as an open note, then you have an octave, which is the C above it, and then a fifth, and then a fourth, and you just continue. It's all, it's, it has to do with physics, but it has to do with waveforms. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a 16 foot uh, length of tubing, and that's why it's in C. So it's the instrument that I use for most of the big orchestral things for the Tchaikovsky's and the, you know, Shostakovich and all of that. It has a, this is a, it's actually, this particular tuba was based upon my uh, tuba teacher's uh, instrument, which was made by York and, um, and was copied. It was, wasn't really until, this is a Yamaha, and it wasn't until this old Japanese craftsman figured out how to copy it. A lot of people had tried and they'd never been able to really copy it. And he finally came up with the right combination of metals and hand tooling and everything else mm. that was able to, to make a copy of that. So mm. that's, that's a C tuba. Okay, so this is an F tuba and it is somewhat smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see, not nearly as large. Now, the reason this is an F tuba, of course, is because it's the shorter tubing. So mm -hmm. it's an F, which is a fourth above the, the low C. I don't know what how many feet that is, probably 12 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it plays the... Uh, you all read the same music, but the fingerings will be different. So mm -hmm. the open note on this, rather than being a C, that lowest open note is F. Mm -hmm. So so this one I use, I, I've had this a number of years, but I haven't used it that much. It's more of a, it's more for quintets and things like that, but I just started using it about two or three years ago with the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And I used it um, with another symphony uh, orchestra uh, for the Rakoczy March, the Hungarian March from the Damnation mm -hmm. of Faust by Berlioz. Mm -hmm. This little tuba you would use for, for instance, um, Symphony Fantastique, the Berlioz Symphony Fantastique. There's um, some lots of real high tuba stuff in it. It's used for more of the higher things, but it's mm -hmm. also used for a lighter sound. Uh, for instance, Brahms uh, Academic Festival Overture. I had this tuba for Downey on that, and it's it's a hoot. I mean, it's just so much fun to play because you can really lean into it without worrying about, you know, burying the rest of the, the orchestra. Mm -hmm. You can kind of play it, you know, really kind of play with a little more uh, force isn't the right word, but you can put more volume into it without burying everybody else. 
Um, it's really, really a fun, fun instrument to play. So, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I, it's okay. I'll let you finish, but then I do have a question. Okay. Um, some uh, players have started using this for uh, the Wagner Meister singer. Some sometimes mm -hmm. it's used for that. So it's you know, and it becomes just kind of a, a, a call. You know that it, usually the tuba player just says, "Well, you know, this this would benefit from using a lighter a lighter touch." So a lighter lighter touch lighter sound, uh, a piece that may have some of more more of the upper ranges of, yes. of the tuba. It, Very much it's so. easier because the instrument is smaller. Now it's interesting to me that you mentioned Berlioz Symphony Fantastique, which uh, is the first really the first time the tuba made its way into the symphony orchestra. We're going to show some pictures of okay. what it was originally yeah. written for, yeah. right? Okay. Off, yeah. of, off yeah. applied. Yes. Um, we'll show you, I'll show you that picture in a second here, but I'm just curious because you said you prefer the F tuba with the symphony fantastique. So is the F tuba closer to what I'm about to show here? Maybe yes. as I'm pulling that up, you could explain that. Yes. Although I have to say that when I played symphony fantastique with Downey, I did it on a C tuba many years ago. Uh -huh. But I think if I were to do it now, I would probably learn it on the F tuba. It'd be learning all new fingerings, but it wouldn't be that hard. So, so there we have it. Now look at this. Can you see this, Tom? Yes. So this is our, <laughs> this is the precursor to the tuba, correct? It is. Yeah, it's kind of a, a hybrid, isn't it? It looks like a combination of a big saxophone. It does. And, and, I, and I'm wondering, it's too bad we can't turn this to the other side because isn't there, it really does look like you're playing a Barry saxophone when, when we're, wherever does. the mouthpiece goes in. It does. And um, uh, th it's got keys like a saxophone, but it uses, mm -hmm. it uses a, um, a tuba mouthpiece, right? Or, you know, a cupped mouthpiece, a brass right. mouthpiece. So it's it's really a hybrid. It was, if I remember right, I think it was invented around 1817. So mm -hmm. it's only only less than 20 years before the tuba. The tuba was invented in 1835. Mm -hmm. Now, Symphony Fantastique, they used, uh, believe it, it was two ophiclides. Mm -hmm. Also, another famous one is the Men Mendelssohn Midsummer Night's Dream mm -hmm. uses uh, uh, ophiclite as well. It's got mm -hmm. a very light, delicate thing. Um, and let's see, by the time Berlioz, Berlioz uh, really loved orchestral color. Mm -hmm. And by the time he got to the damnation of I think it was a damnation of Faust he used one tuba and one ophiclite. So that was, and I think that that was about the last time that they used the ophiclite. So it only, it was only used for about 15, 17 years or so. And then they, you know, they were off and running with a tuba. So. And you could help me. What in the world are these ophiclides in just different pitches? So I would think so. Those are baby ophiclides. I don't know. Yeah, baby. <laughs> what, Look at this guy. I know. The black one. It's, yeah. There was another even weirder instrument before this that was, it's kind of the precursor called the serpent. Uh -huh. And it's even weirder looking than that. And it was wrapped in. There Whoa. you go. That's a serpent. And that stuff around it that looks like leather is leather. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> so it is a very kinky instrument. It's very strange. <laughs> And, and can you can you imagine what this sounded like? Oh, I know. Well, you can. You can hear it used in a film score. If you remember the original Alien, the sure. brilliant Jerry Goldsmith sure. used the serpent as one of his instruments for the Alien. Come on. Yeah, seriously. And there was like one guy in the world that played it, so they you know they brought him in. And it's and, not uh, Tom Carlson. No, no. Oh. I haven't been bit by that serpent. So give me one <laughs> sec. I'm going to put this horn down okay. and right back to you. Okay. So now we've seen your two different size tubas. We've seen the, the serpent. We've seen the opaclides. Now, my next question would be, how the heck do you practice the tuba? I mean, this is, this is something that's, you know, um, I'm, we're dealing with it right now um, over, you know, USC, all of my classes are over Zoom. And so these kids have to practice at home. They can't practice on campus, right? Because, mm -hmm. and a lot of them are having trouble because there's neighbors that are complaining that, you know, there's too much sound. I can't even imagine 
how the heck you deal with this issue with the tuba? Well, let's see, I, when I was first starting the film business, I lived in a little apartment in Sherman Oaks. And obviously you can't, you can't do that. You'd have, you'd get <laughs> evicted after the first practice session. Correct. So what I managed to do was uh, I would sneak onto scoring stages, sound stages, uh, dubbing stages, any place I could find with an unlocked door at six in the morning. I would go <laughs> in before work started and, uh, you know, Sometimes I would make arrangements with uh, a friend that uh, had the keys, but I would, I would find any place I could really to practice because you can't uh, each, every day you don't practice, you basically fall behind too. Correct. So, Correct. Uh, I mean, I, there was uh, one time I was at Fox and I was in a little cutting room and I thought, oh, this place is perfect. It's great. There's a wall right here. I'm, I'm protected, you know, I can play as loud as I want. Well, after practicing, actually, it was the runs on Symphony Fantastique for about a half an hour going over the same thing over and over again. I heard this voice say, hey, tuba player, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize it, but there was a whole apartment building right on the other side of this wall. <laughs> there were probably a lot of other people that wanted to yell. And this was the first guy that had the courage to do it. So, so I stopped practicing there and found another spot. But, found uh, another spot. Yeah. Well, so, uh, yeah, uh, you know, my... Uh, at different homes we've lived in, we've always tried to find at least one room that wouldn't disturb the neighbors, but it's almost impossible. So we finally gave up and we ended up getting this place that we're living in now uh, where we didn't have to worry about the neighbors. Uh huh. And do we have a little clip here that I can I share with our do. viewers? Yes. All right, let's see here. All right. So there I am in our front yard. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't wow. get hit by the drone. <laughs> Look at that front yard. Holy mackerel. So as you can see, we're surrounded by uh, wow. park service and no houses yet. <laughs> wow. So the only people that get are the only creatures that get disturbed are the deer and the ravens and the mountain lions. And you can see here we're coming on to our nearest neighbor which is oh right God. there on sort of the um, upper third right on the right. Yep. yep. And then our second nearest neighbor is back in the background there. So our nearest neighbor is a half a mile away and the next nearest neighbor is a mile away. Wow. Uh, so, so no complaints yet. And luckily the closest one wears hearing devices. So <laughs> if it ever becomes a problem, we can just take them out. <laughs> wow. I will take that view any day. <laughs> Thanks. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so let's move just a little bit into a different direction. I, um, you've been playing with this orchestra forever, mm -hmm. and you've you've done. I don't even know. I don't, I don't, if you, have you even counted how many concerts you've actually done? Yeah, no, I, who knows? I, I I don't know. I would say it's it's probably over two hundred. I would think well over wow. two hundred. Wow, and so, I try yeah. I try our best to include tuba on as many concerts as <laughs> I, I know. can. You know, you know I that know I you do. do. I you know, know you I do. do. So I'm just curious if you ever, if you have any favorite concerts, I mean, that's a loaded question because you've been doing this for so long and it doesn't have to be, you know, during my tenure. I'm just curious if you have any favorite concerts that you can remember and, and why. Oh, um, wow. I mean, it's, well, I'd say first up would probably be The Planet. That was an awesome oh. concert. So much fun. Is that, is that the one we did? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the one you did. And um, uh, I would say Shostakovich's Fifth was great. Yeah. And I mean, at, at every one of them, they all have something, even a little piece for like uh, the New World Symphony, even though it's mm -hmm. only got 14 tuba notes, it's just so awesome to be surrounded by that music. Yeah. You know, it's such a great piece of music and it's, there's, there's nothing like it in the world, live, live music. I mean, you can't get that. I work in the industry that records music and makes it as real as possible. Sure. It doesn't come close to sitting in an, in an auditorium and, and, you know, sitting in an orchestra even more so. 
So you know, I'm really, I'm really glad that you said that because I, I, when we do, when I do program the New World Symphony of the Vortrak, I always feel guilty. Nah. <laughs> I'm like Tom's sitting back there, and he literally has 14 notes, as you, I think, even just said in the whole symphony, but it makes me happy to know that you're enjoying yourself oh, back there. Oh, totally. And I mean, and, and it's it's a it's a little terrifying because it, you start off just as quiet as can be in a very quiet brass chorale. Sure. Um, in both cases. Uh, but it's great. You know, it's wonderful. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, because you don't play at all in the first movement. No, it, it, it I think, is it the, so second, it's the second? It's yeah. the second movement. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I just wonder if you ever find a place in the first movement to just at least maybe just buzz a little bit just to keep your, no, no you just know no. how to do that. Yeah, you just know how to do it. You just practice picking it up cold and, and just doing it, you know, I it's hope like Kathy was saying. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I hope our students are listening to that. Say that again. <laughs> you practice picking the instrument up because this is part of, of, of what you need to do to succeed. Yeah. You have to be able to, to come in cold and, mm -hmm. uh, Particularly something like that, or, uh, you know, uh, well, there's so many pieces where the tuba probably has fewer notes than just about any instrument. Mm -hmm. But when you have them, they count, you know. Sure. It's, it's like the bass drum, yep. you know, some of those yep. instruments in the percussion section. When, right. and, but when they come in, they count. Yes. Yes. And, um, and also that, you know, it's just, it's wonderful that uh, different sections you'll be paired with. We think of it as being a, an extension of the trombones, but sometimes it's with the horns. Sometimes mm. it's with the string bass. Sure. Uh, Death and Transfiguration, I believe you get paired mm -hmm. with the contrabassoon. Sure. So uh, that was another one. Death and Transfiguration is a great piece. Mm. Um, I know we played at the Dorothy Chandler when I, uh, it was the first or second season I was with the orchestra. We did a, a couple of uh, concerts at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. Mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. great. Um, anything by Tchaikovsky I love, especially the fourth and the fifth that we did recently. Yeah. It's just, just lean into it, just lay it down, you know. <laughs> you know, I, so. I've, only, I've only been with the orchestra for 13 years now, and I wanted to make sure that we covered all the Tchaik Tchaikovsky mm -hmm. symphonies. We ha we've covered most of the Brahms symphonies. You, of course, only play in the second, right? Uh, third, I believe, isn't it? Brahms two, tuba. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but I, you know, but um, but again, I'm always trying to keep in mind how can I make sure to to program something that Tom's going to be able to participate <laughs> in because you don't play in every single piece. No, you know. no. I mean, Beethoven, bless his heart, he's an okay composer, but he never wrote for tuba. I mean, he was just writing too early. You know, <laughs> um, he could have been I a just, really good composer had he done that. You know. <laughs> I mean, we live in learn, I suppose, I guess, you know. Mozart, yeah. Mozart, you know. Um, Whatever. So, you know, there, there must be pieces on your list that we, we just, you know, we have never done or we haven't done in years. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any pieces that, that come to mind that you would love for us to program for you. As a matter of fact. There is one piece that I have always wanted to play and never have with any of the orchestras, mainly because it's just such a monster, but the mm -hmm. Mahler Second Symphony, the Resurrection Symphony. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, and I'm gonna make a pitch now, but oh. once, we, once we come back from this horrible pandemic, you know, with so many lives lost that and, and we are resurrected as a community and as an orchestra mm -hmm. and as mm -hmm. a nation for mm -hmm. a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. Wow, what, what a glorious piece that would be to play, mm. you know, and. Writing it down. Okay. Mahler two per Tom Carlson's request. <laughs> it really would be something, huh? It would, it would. And, uh, you know, I sang it when I was at Northwestern. That's one of the things you had to do is be in the choir, you know. And, ah. So um, I, I got a chance to, to perform it, but only in the choir. And it's, it's not a, a terribly uh, difficult piece for choir. I know there's soloists, mm -hmm. uh, there's backstage brass. I mean, it, I think we could fit it in, in at Downey. We, we'd have to be creative, but we might be able to do that and put the, the backstage brass 
up in the uh, balcony, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. in the, you know, I mean, it's possible. It would take some extra funding, which I'm sure we can we can we can get into that later. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That stage at Downey that that's a very large stage. It is. And um, I mean, we did host the planets, which of, that had backstage. Of course, it mm -hmm. had backstage choir, but it but it has a, a very large orchestra. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so but we we should definitely think about Mahler too, because this this I have a feeling we could fit us all in there and we could get creative, you know, with backstage brass. Yeah. We we yeah. we definitely could. Yeah. It would so. be uh, that would be a, a bucket list, I think they call it. <laughs> bucket list. All right. Well, I'm glad you brought that up and I'm gonna talk to my board about that because it will take some extra funding, but we we shall see. Um I think maybe let's close today. I've sort of asked this question every Zoom session now, and I just would love to hear you played, as you mentioned, in many orchestras, community, uh, at school, professional. What is it about the Downey Symphony that you love? To, you know, specifically the Downey Symphony. Oh, so many things. I, I think I mentioned earlier. Each orchestra has its own personality. Mm -hmm. Downey to me, and it, I know other people have said this on these Zoom meetings, but it, it, it's like a family. It's mm -hmm. unique in that way that mm -hmm. because we've all been around each other for so long, uh, so many of us, and mm -hmm. when new people come in, they're embraced. I think they're welcomed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of my best friends are actually the musicians that I sat next to. I mean, I, uh, you know, I could go on and not Rob Coomber, brilliant uh, bass trombone player. And mm -hmm. Rob is so great. I mean, uh, you know, if there's ever, if I ever have any question, he's a lot more experienced, has played a lot more different uh, orchestras. Mm -hmm. So if I have a question about phrasing or anything like that, he's always so generous with you mm -hmm. know, advice and it's always the right advice. I mean, I know on one concert, it, it was oddly enough, a children's concert, but I got about a stage fright. It, it happens, you know, mm -hmm. and I, and I was, you know, for it just kind of came out of the blue. And he said, Tom, he goes, all you had to do, just imagine you're coming down, you've had a cup of coffee, you're sitting in your robe, you pick up the tube, but you play. There's nobody else in the audience, just do it. <laughs> you know, and, you know, it, second and third uh, concert for the kids, it was perfect. Mm -hmm. So, you know, isn't that amazing? Just a little comment just from somebody you respect like that. Yeah. Just it just puts everything right into focus. And, and, and it, and it's something you carry with you for the rest of your, your playing career. You know? Sure. And then, sure. you know, uh, Danielle and, you know, I mean, all, all through the orchestra, Mark Artuzio and Kathy mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. you know, just so many people, I, you know, don't want to leave people out, but in, in our own little pod right there with Grant mm -hmm. and, and Kathy mm -hmm. and Brad Close, terrific first trombone player. Yeah, yeah. I just, I feel so lucky to be playing next to these people and to yeah. be learning from them and also mm -hmm. hopefully contributing myself, you know, to the, mm -hmm. to the sound of the orchestra. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's just that, uh, you know, and, and we're friends uh, socially and one good thing to come out of this pandemic has been Facebook and, and being more in contact with people, mm -hmm. at least that way, you know, so, mm -hmm. sure. um, you know, we've, we've all been trading pictures and everything else while we're, while we're locked away. So, mm -hmm. but man, I can't tell you how much we want to get back. <laughs> so. Well, you, you and me both, I just, I just cannot wait. I'm feeling encouraged I feel like this, mm -hmm. the, the vaccination is really, um, is really helping. And I think it's, I think, I fingers crossed. I think we're going to be back in the fall. I really do. I hope so. I, we had, my wife and I had that um, certain birthday that allowed us to get our vaccination. I won't say which one, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the next day I was down at Dodger stadium. So I'm fully vaxxed now and immune. Great, so. great, great, great. Yeah. Me too. I've done shot one of two because I'm an okay. educator. So yeah. I'm in that sort of second tier. Yeah. Yeah. Great. You're, you definitely are an essential worker. So <laughs> well, we think you are. I, I feel, well, I, yeah, I appreciate that. I feel like the, you know, the teachers at the high school, middle school and elementary level, though, those to me are the real essential workers. And I'm just, I'm just blessed that I can be mixed up in, in all of those wonderful people. So.
Anyway, well, Tom, I, I just can't thank you enough. Our audience can't thank you enough. It's such a pleasure uh, having spoken with you today. And we're so lucky to have you uh, as our principal tuba for so many years. Oh, thank you. you. You just have created such a wonderful consistency back there with the best energy. I can just tell you from the podium how much I appreciate people like you. Oh, thank not you. Only can, not only can play so exceptionally well, but that energy that comes back to me when I'm on the podium. Um, I just hope you know how much I appreciate it. So oh, thank you. Thank you. There you have it. It works uh, both ways. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. So thank you very much again for being with us. I want to remind everybody that even though, again, we cannot be with you physically, you can always support us by visiting our website right there on the home homepage. You can find ways to donate, not just uh, financially, but other ways, your time, volunteer work. And that's of course, www.downysymphony.org. And um, I also wanna thank the Downey Symphonic Society board members for sponsoring the Zoom series. And I look forward to seeing everybody uh, at our next one. Thank you again, Tom Carlson. Thank you. And we'll see you all soon. Thanks everybody.